recordar y no sé. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. What's going on? That's good to see you. Let's all stand real quick and we'll pray and get to singing. Lord Jesus, we thank you for how good you are, God. We thank you that even though this world has gone crazy, we have a rock uh, and a fortress and um, a God that cannot be moved. God, we thank you that you love us and, and that cannot be changed and your faithfulness is always the same. You're always faithful, God. I just thank you that we have a rock such as you to lean on uh, in the times like this. So God, we pray that you would help us draw closer to you uh, right here tonight, Lord, that we would worship you with all of our hearts, that we would dive deeper into your word, have more of a hunger for you, uh, give more of our life to you and all the things that, that we can give to you more of that we would do so and that you'd help get the things that are hindering that out of our lives. So we give over all of us, Lord, we want to be more like you. So God, I pray that you bless tonight, that you teach us by your spirit and be blessed by our worship in Jesus name. Amen.
us sing of your love over and over I sing of your love over and over I sing with every setting sun your faithful amen you can be seated if you words to capture all you are no lofty thought no scholar of this world could grasp an inch of such infinity though we cannot comprehend such a mystery 
Just a glimpse of you revealed is compelling us to say, Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy is your name. And all of heaven joins the universe ever cry. Hearts amazed and songs that never frame the fullness of your worth and majesty. We come again and fall on bended knee and hear adore the God that we don't see. a mystery just a glimpse of you revealed is compelling us to say
all stand to sing this. I lift my voice to sing of your goodness. my voice to sing of your goodness. I lift my voice to sing of your love. I lift my voice to sing hallelujah. Jesus our Savior, your remain standing. Let me pray. Just so good to be with you tonight on this cold night and uh, looking forward to some amazingly interesting chapters tonight. So we're going to be starting Ezekiel 40 tonight. Let me open in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for your tremendous faithfulness to us, your 
desire to speak to us tonight, Lord, we're sure going to be reminded you're a God of tremendous detail, detail, unbelievable detail, Lord. And uh, Lord, I just pray that even if nothing else tonight, we would know from this, you care about every detail of our lives as well. Tonight, you care so much about little things. And, and everything is little to you because you're so awesome and powerful. And so Lord, our big problems are small to you, and we're thankful that you can handle them all. We can come to you for your grace and peace in the midst of anything we're going through and enjoy the work of your Holy Spirit, including peace, Lord, supernatural peace. So, Lord, we just pray you'd really bless us tonight, Lord, and bless all those who can't make it and those that are sick and everything going on in this. Uh, now, on top of corona with the flu and cold season, Lord, just bless people and draw them close to yourself, we pray. We ask you to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please be seated. Ezekiel 40. I'm going to give a little bit of an extended introduction tonight uh, to what we normally look at. I just feel it's necessary uh, for these uh, particular chapters because they really are almost uh, mind-boggling, mind-numbing, if you will. Uh, if you don't like math and all that, you may not really like some of the details the Lord gives us. If you're a math person, you like all that stuff, great, you'll love it. So anyway, you might want to download the overheads, which I will put up a little bit later, but all the overheads you can get tonight, they're on our website. Plus, if you just text OHW for Overheads Wednesday, you'll get them uh, on your screen if you want to watch them on top of on the, the screen uh, up overhead. But as we begin uh, uh, in this introduction, I want to give a quick introduction to what we're going to look at in these nine chapters, 40 to 48, and, and then get into a, a little bit again of an extended introduction just to some of the issues around these chapters. So first up tonight, we're going to cover the first section, chapter 40 to 43, which is uh, the future temple. There will be a temple built after Jesus raptures the church out of here. And then several months later, a treaty is signed. That signing of the treaty kicks off the great tribulation period for seven years. And then within a little bit, a couple of months after the end of the great tribulation, Jesus will establish his reign, build this temple that we're going to see tonight, physically build it, and then rule and reign in Jerusalem. And so we're going to cover the building of that temple to, tonight. Then next week, we're going to cover the last two sections to end these nine chapters, 44 to 46. Talk about the leaders during Jesus' reign. We'll look at some of the leaders tonight, but really get into the leaders next week. And then 47 to 49, the distribution of the land. Uh, he'll break up the land by tribes, but it'll be different than what was broken up uh, under the law of Moses when they came in to the promised land. So now in this introduction, I'm going to ask and answer four questions, which I think need to be uh, asked and answered, because if you've ever studied these and you've read other commentaries, there's all kinds of debates about what's happening here. So the first one is, when will this prophecy uh, of the temple be fulfilled? When will it be? Now, there is some views that this happened in the past. This has not. This is, in my opinion, very, very strongly, this is all future. We haven't seen this yet. This is a temple that will be built by Jesus after again, after he uh, comes back to rule and reign. But some believe it looks back to uh, temples, for example, the temple of Solomon. Well, the dimensions here are so ridiculously different. In fact, if we could put up overhead number one, that'd be great. Um, okay, do you see the orange one, the little, the, almost the smallest one, the smallest one on your right, the brown one, and then the orange one there? That was Solomon's temple compared to the size of this temple. It's a little bit bigger. So it's like way bigger. So uh, just pretty amazing. So that one on the left, the huge one, that's what we're studying tonight. And so some believe it's that. Some believe it's Zerubbabel's temple, which is even smaller than Solomon's. And of course, that really can't be. And uh, by the way, the glory of God never even came into Zerubbabel's temple. The glory of God will come into this temple. And so that is uh, another problem. Some uh, kind of uh, spiritualize this whole thing and say that's not really a temple. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but when you look at the mind-numbing detail the Lord gives, I found it extremely hard to believe God would go to that level of detail for something that's spiritual. I mean, this many cubits and that many cubits, I mean, incredible detail. And so some say it's like the church and we're all a temple of the Holy Spirit and it represents some spiritual truth. And there are many spiritual truths in it, but I just reject that entirely. And then some think it's something in Revelation 21, 22, in the new heavens and the new earth after the thousand years. Well, that doesn't work in any way because in Revelation 21, we're actually told there's no temple in the new Jerusalem, the one that is made that comes down and hovers above heaven uh, into eternity. And so it can't be that. It, it just, to me, it has to be a literal temple. 
And so uh, I'm going to teach it that way because I strongly, strongly believe it is a very literal temple. And so uh, we're going to look at some of those. Uh, what reasons can be given for a literal temple? Let me give you some that I believe. Number one, God gave Ezekiel this all to write down. Please look at verse 4 here, the first chapter tonight. It says, the man said to me, uh, there's a man, I think he's an angel. Speak on behalf of the Lord. Son of man, look with your eyes, hear with your ears, fix your mind on everything I show you, for you were brought here so that I might sh uh, show them to you, declare them to the house of Israel, everything you see. Why would he go to the trouble of telling him to write all this stuff down to communicate these particular truths? So he had him write them down. Secondly, the tremendous amount of detail again is given. As I mentioned a moment ago, I just can't see the Lord going to this level of detail. I mean, it's just kind of uh, mind boggling that he would go to this level of detail and, and, and it, there's no real meaning to it. Uh, thirdly, Ezekiel went out of his way to tell us when things were not literal. And he, and he never talks like that here in these chapters. He talks like this is for real building and they're going to be this size and all that for example in chapter 37 we just studied two weeks ago uh, three weeks ago now i think um, we saw do you remember the valley of bones chapter and representing israel well the bones represented the house of israel we were specifically told that in verse 11 he said to me son of man these bones are the whole house of israel so when something represented something the lord would tell us that he never tells us that with this temple he just talks about it and then in chapter 19, he talked about the two sticks representing the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, them becoming one nation. So the sticks represented the nation, and, and the dry bones represented the nation of Israel. And so none of that is given here. None of that saying this looks like something or represents something. Uh, next, many of the Old Testament prophets, it is not just Ezekiel that said, that talked about this temple. It was talked about by Isaiah chapter 2 and 60, Daniel chapter 9, Joel chapter 3, Micah chapter 4, Haggai chapter 2, Zechariah chapter 6 and 14, and these. So this is very, very serious to the Lord to, say, to speak about it in that many uh, different places. The fifth reason is Israel's uh, early, or Ezekiel's early prophecies. Everything we saw in chapters 1 all the way up near to 32, they've all been fulfilled. Historically, except the ones that had overflowing, uh, you know, imagery into the future. But everything he said came to pass. Why would this not come to pass as well? And so I believe it will be fulfilled uh, literally. And then some look at it as symmetrical, that he said all the stuff he said before, then he went to the judgment of the nations and now comes back to this. And uh, that all came to pass, I believe, for the same reason. This will also uh, come to pass. Uh, the a seventh reason is it's very interesting. The Lord particularly picks out the family of Zadok among the priests. Under the law of Moses, all of the sons of Levi, direct descendants, then of the family of Aaron, were to be the priests. He's only going to allow the family of the Zadok family within the tribe of Aaron uh, lead, lead the priests. This is very interesting. He's going to lay that out and give the reasons why in these chapters because of some of their faithfulness back when the kingdom was going uh, kind of haywire. And so this one here, again, all those reasons, I believe it's literal. The, the third question, what are the... Uh, objections to the literal interpretation of the temple. And, and I get it, and I, I, I get the argument. The number one is they believe we're being dragged back into the law of Moses. And it's very clear that Hebrews chapter 7 through 10, the Lord went to great lengths to say, we're not going back to that anymore. We're not going back to the law of Moses. Jesus Christ is the end of the law to those who believe. But what's to say there's not another law? Remember, Jesus is not a priest of the order of the Levites the Aaronic priesthood. He's of the Melchizedek priesthood. And it's my opinion, this is the Melchizedek priesthood we're seeing in the future. And Jesus will uh, have some other things done. Uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, in a book called Footsteps of the Messiah, he went and explained at least 20 differences between the law of Moses and some of the laws that are carried out here in the book of Ezekiel. So this is not a rehashing of the law of Moses. This is not that. For example, there's no Ark of the Covenant mentioned. There's no, there's no uh, cherubim. There's no mercy seat. There is drawings and etchings of the cherubim, but, but none there. No veil, uh, no golden candles, candlestick, no table of showbread. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So there, there's just many, many differences. Um, all, then the next objection is that it's too big. I mean, when you looked at that first drawing and the size of that temple, it's clear it wouldn't fit on the current temple mount. If you've ever been to the Temple Mount and walked on the Temple Mount, it's quite a stunning scene. 
And you've, you've often seen the view when somebody's standing on the Mount of Olives and you see the golden dome behind it. And, and you can imagine that Solomon's temple. You could probably fit the size of that temple on the current temple mount and maybe two more of those, but that's it. And you see the size of that, it wouldn't fit. Well, that's kind of a, uh, it's, it's really a pretty worthless argument considering there'll be earthquakes during the Great Tribulation on top of the fact that when Jesus sets himself down on the Mount of Olives, there's gonna be a splitting of the land. He's gonna re-topographically change everything in the world. So we don't need the current mount to fit a temple on there. And so I just don't think it is a, a quality uh, argument. And, and, then, and then the biggest argument, and, and this is, I, I would admit, the strongest argument, the biggest objection is, and I have my own kind of weird kind of reservations, like why is the Lord allowing animal sacrifices during his millennial reign? I mean, you have to admit, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, all of the animals, and it's even my opinion that in the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, that Elijah and Moses, that's who I believe are the two witnesses. It doesn't mean much. It's just people's opinions. But they're going to be witnessing to the Jewish people saying, why do you want to rebuild the temple? Why do you want animal sacrifices? Jesus was the answer. You don't need him anymore. But again, I believe this is a different law system that is being given to us. It's just my opinion. And But, but the, the, really the, the, the last question is, you know, what, what is it, you know, the different views and, and reasons? Why are there animal sacrifices in this reign? And there's been a lot of speculation. It's my opinion, just one, and it's in no way the opinion, uh, that there's going to be so little death during the thousand-year reign. They're, they're going to need to be reminded of death. It's kind of interesting, right? Today, we have death all, all around us, it's just everywhere. And I believe death is a, a, a warning from the Lord uh, of the cost of sin. So he wants us to know about this. Well, when you, have, when you have the description of the book of Isaiah that a child dies at 100 years old, death will be extremely rare. And so they'll be like, I'm not going to die. I mean, if you think, you, if you think people at 20 years old today think they'll live forever, imagine then. I'm going to live to be 900 or 1,000 years old during the millennial reign. If somebody's a human and living, they could live that long, I believe, back to the days of Eden. And so uh, they'll almost need a reminder that death was what uh, provided for the covering of sins. And so uh, anyway, uh, some say it's a, just a memorial view. You know, it's just like we have communion to remember what Jesus did for us. And he'll remind the people during that time what Jesus did for us. I tend to think Jesus will likely even still have the marks on his hands while he's reigning for the thousand years. And you'll get to see him with his marks and remember he died for us. But some see it's is a memorial view. That may be, oh, that may be it. Um, I don't know that that necessarily requires them to be done again. Uh, there's a paper done in the uh, Dallas Theological Academic Journal in the Bibliotheca Sacra where they talked about one man believed it had to do with only ceremonial cleansing, not actual cleansing. I like the thought. I don't know really that it fits. The ceremonial laws... Within the law of Moses, remember, there were moral laws and ceremonial laws. The ceremonial laws spoke of your person's spiritual condition, whether they were in or out of Christ, whether they were saved or not. That's what the, the purpose of those was. And in that way, that could work. You know, the sacrifices represent that. But there's actually a sin offerings uh, in there. And so, you know, it's not the particular. And by the way, the only sin that won't be forgiven is the rejection of Christ anyway. So sin offerings for general sin, um, I don't know. It just doesn't uh, quite fit for me. I'm just not sure if that's it. One of the other reasons I tend to believe is that the Lord may allow them just because we'll finally see the Jewish people really full bore worshiping the Lord. And he wants the world to see them worshiping him. If you remember in this book of Ezekiel in chapter 20, we were told uh, of the sacrifices on the mountain in the future. And in verse 41 of chapter 20, he said, I'll accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the countries where you've been scattered. And I'll be hallowed in you before the Gentiles. And so the Lord will finally be reverenced in front of the Gentiles. Because in the book of Ezekiel, we've seen the Lord's name being just trashed in front of the Gentiles in, in all of this uh, scene. And then lastly, again, it's not the law of Moses. And so I believe it's just another priesthood order. And so for some reason, the Lord's going to allow it. And one day when we get to heaven, he'll tell us why he did it. So anyway, I just believe they're real. And so we're going to dig into it, believing it's real. And so um, let's, let's uh, pick up here, verse 1. And notice, oh, by the way, this is the last time marker in the book. We've had many time markers in the book as we've been marching through the book. And now we're told it's the 25th year of the captivity. Remember, Zedekiah was the last king of, of, of Judah, and he reigned for 11 years. 
So you're in the 25th year, you're now 14 years past the actual fall of Jerusalem. So Ezekiel has now gone a few years without any revelations from the Lord. He did have some after the fall, but it's been a while. We're even specifically told, notice in that verse, it was in the 14th year after the city was captured. Now remember, he's in Babylon getting this revelation, although the Lord's going to supernaturally transport him to see this whole scene going down. But anyway, he is, he's in Babylon, and he's receiving this 14 years after the capture of Babylon. It says, so it was captured on the very same day the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. So he was, he was uh, supernaturally transported there, physically transported there. I don't know. He got to see this vision. Verse 2, in the visions, God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain on it. Uh, toward the south was something like the structure of a city. So he's looking at Jerusalem. Now, it's, isn't it interesting the way he described it? Something like the structure of a city? Now, don't you think if it was the current day Jerusalem, he'd have recognized it? He would have. But it's topographically very different. And so it's, it's no surprise to be saying it's something like the structure of a city. I haven't seen a city like this. He hasn't seen a rejuvenated earth city. Ezekiel had never seen that. And so he's seeing this. Bottom line, though, the Lord put him on this place on this mountain to see Jerusalem. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze, and he had a line of flax and measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. Now, because it has this uh, appearance of bronze, some people think it's Jesus. I clearly don't. I think it's just an angel. Later, it's almost like we're going to see him interacting with Jesus, this man. But this, I believe this is just an angel in the appearance of a man. And he's uh, basically his tour guide, if you will, Ezekiel's tour guide to look at this future temple. And then we see the instructions that he was given to Ezekiel. The man said, son of man, remember he gave him that. That title was given to him over 90 times in the book. But here's the commands. Look with your eyes, hear with your ears, fix your mind on everything I show you. Why? Notice the word for. For you were brought here so that I might show them to you. I mean, God went to all the trouble to bring him there to show him this thing. God's that serious about this temple. He wants him to see. And then he said, declare it to the house of Israel, everything you see. Later, he's going to be told to write everything down once he sees it. But right now, he's saying, I want you to declare it. And you can imagine with the detail, I don't know how furiously Ezekiel scribbling with his hand trying to get these notes down, but uh, the Lord will likely give him some supernatural recall. So declare to the house of Israel, everything you see. Now, there was a wall all around the outside of the temple. Now that we're in verse 5, if we can put up an overhead number 2, um, this will be helpful. This is a pretty good drawing, uh, I believe, of the building. Uh, the only thing I don't like is the outer wall looks a little thin. You notice it? That wall is 10 and a half feet thick, tall and thick. So you, can, you ever imagine walking like through a doorway today, walk through a threshold, what's that wall? Six inches with studs and drywall? I mean... That thing's 10 and a half feet thick, that wall all the way around, 10 and a half feet tall, 10 and a half feet thick. That is quite a wall. That looks kind of flimsy to me, that particular wall. But uh, anyway, we'll be, we'll be looking at, uh, at these details. We'll leave this one up. Most of this chapter, you notice, I put the numbers where the verses relate to what we're looking at. But there's a wall all around the outside of the temple. In the man's hand was a measuring rod, six cubits long. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament cubit, it's typically 18 inches. But everything we look at in these chapters is based on a 21-inch cubit. It's a little longer than a cubit, and we're told right here in this verse, and each being a cubit and a hand breadth. So it's first, uh, the man's hand was a measuring rod. This rod is six cubits long, so you'd be thinking nine feet. But it's not because it's a cubit and a hand breadth, and it's pretty generally believed this represents an extra three inches, so we're talking 21 inches. Well, that puts all kinds of weird math into all this. But anyway, the bottom line is we believe this wall to be 10 and a half feet thick. So it's one, uh, each cubit is one and three quarters feet thick. And so to have a rod that's measuring six feet uh, represents this 10, 10 and a half feet. So he measured the width of the wall, one rod, and the height, one rod. So both the depth and the height of this wall was these six, uh, these six uh, particular uh, cubits that were uh, of this particular length. So that is quite a wall. I mean, imagine, that's just the entry. That's just the very beginning of walking into this particular place. Now, please notice that you're right. You'll see that it says, uh, what does that say? It says, outer court, eastern gateway. To your right, you'll see chapter 40, verses 6 to 15. We're now going to go through in depth that one gateway. 
And the Lord spent several verses describing this gateway. This is important to him. She may go, well, it doesn't mean nothing to me. It's important to the Lord. And one day we'll realize why. But uh, if it was important enough to the Lord to write it down, it should be important to us. But anyway, this is so fasting. Now, just that gateway, imagine you're looking from the sky down. And then the, uh, the next page is the interior of that looking downward. So uh, slide number three. There we go. So you see those steps down there at the bottom? You step up when you get to the top. That first piece of gray is the 10 and a half feet stepping into this particular gateway. This gateway is, is 50 cubits deep. So we're almost 90 feet deep. Is that an entryway? Most people's houses aren't that big. He's got a 90 foot, almost 90 foot entry just to get through that first entryway. That's just a little piece to get into uh, the temple area. So when you, when you look at that, this begins to make a little bit of sense here, this gateway. He says he went to the gateway which faced east. By the way, the Lord always tends to hit the eastern gate first because when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back on the Mount of Olives and come through the eastern gate. That's his, his entryway. And so uh, he comes to the east. He went up its stairs and measured the threshold. So the threshold is the wall itself which was one rod wide, and the other threshold was one rod wide. Now, you'll notice up there I put threshold, one here and one later, because I believe the other threshold he mentions here in verse 6 is the second one up before the vestibule up at the top. And so uh, there's two of these, uh, both 10 and a half feet long. Uh, each gate chamber was one rod long and, and one rod wide. Now, when he says the gate chambers, you'll notice it's these three, I think they have the letter A on them. Is that right? Yeah. You're going to see three on each side, three uh, little gate chambers. And so it, you walk through a gate chamber and then a, a little bit more of a wall and then a gate chamber and a wall and, and then the net last threshold and then that. And the Lord wants us to know all of this. Each gate chamber is one rod wide and uh, one rod along and wide. Uh, between the gate chambers was a space of five cubits. And then, so after you get through the uh, gateway and then space and gateway and space and gateway, then you get to the last uh, threshold before you get to the vestibule. And so he says that in verse 8, he also measured the vestibule on the inside gate, uh, one rod. That was just the, the, the wall piece right before that last vestibule. Last vestibule is a little larger. It's eight cubits deep, and the gate post two cubits, and the vestibule of the gate was on the inside. And in the eastern gateway were three gate chambers on one side and uh, the three on the other, the three were all the same size. Now he, he went all up to the vestibule and kind of steps back and talks about those three little chambers that he talked about for a moment. And then he says, and he measured the width of the entrance of the gateway, 10 cubits. So uh, that's the width um, there at the very end as you're entering the last piece of the wall to get into the uh, outer court. And so he says, in the length of the, the gate, 13 cubits. So there's a, a space in front of the gate chambers, one cubit on this side, one cubit on the other side. The gate chambers were six cubits on this side, six on this side. And he measured the gateway from the roof of the gate chamber to the roof of the other. The width was 25 cubits. So the entire width of that thing from outer wall to one side to the other side is 25 cubits. So it's 25 cubits by 50 cubits. The Lord wanted all this written down for us to see. Now, can you, can you, you look at this and go, can this be spiritual? I don't think so. Why would the Lord go to all this trouble? I was just fasting that he wants us to know. He recorded this all for us. And so that was, uh, let's see, or as I just read, I think verse 13, 25 cubits. Yeah, he measured uh, verse 14, the gate post, 60 cubits high. Oh, on top of this, the, the length of that, that, that structure, you notice the original drawing was really 60 cubits tall. It's over 100 feet tall. Here, this entire building structure just to enter one gateway. And there's six of them and they're all exactly the same measurement. So there's three on the outer court, three on the inner court. And so he says from the uh, front of the entrance gate to the entrance of the inner court was 50 cubits. That's our length. If you walk to that, you'd walk that 50 cubits and finally be in the outer court. There were beveled windows. You can see on each of the little alcoves there. The, the, the gate chambers, there's little windows, so you'd catch a little sunlight coming in on both sides. And, uh, and, and the intervening archways and the inside of the gateway all around, likewise in the vestibules, there were windows all around in, in, on this inside, and each gate post were palm trees. We're going to see a lot of palm trees. Palm trees representing life. 
And uh, it's just very, very interesting how the Lord uh, chose to pick on palm trees. I don't know why he picked on this particular one. The trees that represent Israel, you think of the uh, olive tree and the fig tree, but he picked on the palm tree here. It is interesting to me, uh, this whole temple screams of Jesus to me, but uh, we remember the week before Jesus died, he walked and they threw palm branches at his feet and received the, his praise because he deserved it. And so palm branches clearly are connected to Jesus. We have Palm Sunday and all this, but there's going to be palm trees really drawn all uh, over the place. So that gets us through that. And then we move into the uh, outer court, the outer court. So back to overhead number two, that'd be great. You can picture now you've stepped through that first one and now you're standing in the court. And you'll notice it's kind of a pink pavement that finishes the rest of the distance from the gateway. That's to separate uh, the flooring from right at the very end of the gateway. And that's called the pavement that runs around that's kind of pink. But now you're standing inside the uh, uh, outer court. It says, he brought me to the outer court. There were chambers and a pavement made all around the court. The pavement's that more pinkish hue that runs around the court, which covers the distance between the wall and the, and the end of the gateway. So that ran around. And it says, oh, by the way, there were 30 chambers facing that. So what he's talking about there is these... Uh, is these uh, chambers. So if you can picture these chambers running right here and here, there's 10 here, 10 here, and 10 here. So the 30 chambers he's mentioning, uh, we're not told why the, what those chambers are for. Some think they were for the priest to, to rest because the priests are going to do other things in other buildings over here near the temple. But uh, just very interesting here that he mentions uh, all of these uh, 30 chambers that face the pavement. And the pavement was by the side of the gateways corresponding to the length and the gateways. This was the lower pavement. Then he measured the width of the front of the lower gateway to the front of the inner gateway, extending 100 cubits. All he's saying here is the difference between this gateway and that gateway is 100 cubits. There's 50, 100, another 50, another 50 to the very center. That's 250 because the whole thing's 500 cubits by 500 cubits. And so he's very precise to kind of lay all this out. So we know it's all extremely uh, symmetrical where it, where it can be. Next, he moves, and very quickly, we'll move through the northern gateway. Uh, so if we uh, notice on that chart now, next he goes to the northern. So now we're looking at this one right up here. And, and all, uh, basically, we can read this very quickly. It's just the same as the other one. So the outer court was also a gateway facing north. He measured its length and its width. Its gate chambers were three on this side, three on that side. It's all the same. Gate post archways had the same measurement as the first gate. Its length was 50 cubits, its width 25. We can see it's exactly the same. All six of those are the same, the three on the out and the three leading to the inner court. Its windows and those of its archways and also its palm trees had the same measurements as the gateway facing east. It was ascended by seven steps. Now, w w one thing I love about what the Lord does is every time you move closer, Lord, you're coming upwards. So you took steps to the first gateway, you come steps to the second gateway. The imagery of the Lord is whenever you come to the Lord, you're coming up. You never go down. We talk about, you know, going low when somebody goes low. The Lord never does that. We come up to him. That's why he even built all of Jerusalem up on a mount. We come up to the Lord. It's always an upward movement for us to come into the presence of the Lord. And so he drives that point home. Everything's ascending in, in, in nature. There's seven steps there. The number of completion its archways was in front of it. The gate of the inner court was opposite the northern gate, just as the eastern gateway. And he measured from the gateway to gateway 100 cubits. Again, just that reminder. Now the southern gateway, so on the left side, and he just repeats in effect what he just said about the northern gateway. He brought me toward the south. There was a gateway was facing south. He measures at gate posts and archways according to these same measurements. There were windows in it and archways all around like those windows. Its length was 50 cubits. Its width 25 cubits. Seven steps led to it as well. Archway was in front of them. It had palm trees on the gate post. There was also a gateway on the inner court facing south and that measured from gateway to gateway towards the south, 100 cubits. So see all the symmetry all over the place. Now it comes to the gateways of the inner court. And what do you know? They're the same. And the Lord didn't just say, hey, same as those. He could have, you know, he could have 20, verse 28 could have just one verse and said, they're just like those three, move along. He didn't do that. It's interesting. He brought me to the inner court through southern gateway so now he's acting like when he was given this display he came here he went to look at the north he went to look at the south now he's coming through that gateway into the temple into the inner court and so he came through the southern gateway according to the same measurements its gate chambers its gate posts its archways according to the same measurements there were windows were in it and its archway all around 50 cubits by 25 cubits again archways all around 25 cubits long 
five cubits wide. Its archway faced the outer court. Palm trees were in it on its gateposts. Going up to it were, were eight steps. Oh, that's interesting. He had a step there and he brought me into the inner court facing east. So he's, he's now right in about the center here looking towards this gatepost, looking through that post to the outer court while standing uh, in the inner court. And so it says, he brought me into the uh, inner court facing east, measured the gateway according to the same measurements. That eastern gateway is the same. Gate chambers, gate posts, archways according to these same measurements. There were windows in it. It's archways all around. Again, 50 cubits by 25. Its archways faced the outer court and palm trees were on it as well. And going up to it were eight steps. Then he brought me to the north gateway, measured it according to the same measurements. Also, its gate chambers, its gate posts, archway. It had windows all around. Again, 50 by 25 Verse 37, his gate posts faced the outer court. Palm trees were on the gate posts. On this side, on that side, was going up and were eight steps. Now, you're going to get some of these, you're going to like, you know, uh, my sight's bad, so I can't see your eyes glaze over when it happens tonight. But uh, there are some really good nuggets here we don't want to miss. In the next section, we see a couple. So notice in verse uh, 38, he's going to talk about when they are preparing the sacrifices, because there are sacrifices. There's many verses mentioning sacrifices in these next few chapters. It says, there was a chamber in its entrance by the gatepost, the gateway, where they washed the burnt offerings. What you're going to see is almost all the offerings, the altars right here in the center. So just here, the northern, all the tables where they're going to be prepping the animals are going to be by the northern gateway. And I'll cover why in a moment. It's fascinating what the Lord has done. But, but you can imagine that, and then um, what's going to happen is in this, he said here, in the vestibule of the gateway were two tables. So if, if we could go back to slide three, that'd be great. So yeah, see this vestibule right here in the end of the gateway? Now back to number two slide. Imagine that at the end of this gateway closest to the altar. He's going to put a couple tables in the, in the vestibule of this tower and right outside the vestibule of that tower. So all the animals are being prepped right there on the north side of the altar here at this northern gateway. And so he said, uh, what does he want to prepare? Two tables on this side, two tables on that side, one on which to slay the burnt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. At the other side of the vestibule, as one goes to the entrance of the northern gateway, were two tables on, on the other side of the vestibule. So I, I, I personally picture in this, if you were to walk from the altar in the center to go back through the northern gateway, you see two tables on each side and two tables outside that, that gateway right there. All these tables, so the, the priests are killing animals, uh, a lot of them. And so uh, there they are, and then there's four tables on this side, four tables on that side. By the side of the gateway, eight tables on which they slaughtered the sacrifices. There were four tables of hewn stone for the burnt offering, one cubit and a half long, one cubit and a half wide, one cubit and a half on which they laid them. Instruments with which they slaughtered the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. Inside were hooks, a handbreadth wide, fastened all around, and the flesh of the sacrifices on the tablets. Now let me stop here, because this is what I find fascinating. It's just a little, little nugget from the Lord, but I just, I, I personally marvel at the, the detail of the Lord. And here's why. If you remember in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 11, there's the only other place in Scripture where the Lord said where to kill animals when they killed them. He didn't even mention the other ones. He just assumed he set the record straight in Leviticus 1, 11, under the law of Moses when they killed animals. It's always be killed on the north side of the altar. And isn't it interesting that even in the millennial reign, they'll be killed on the north side of the altar? Well, to me, there's a simple reason. We're never told why in Scripture. But if you go to the Temple Mount today, if you're standing on the current Temple Mount area, you have to look to the north. If you look north, you're looking directly at Golgotha. Jesus died to the north. So the two places in all of scripture where animals are killed is to the north of the altar because that is the direction where Jesus died. Never let animals be killed on the east, the west, the south, only to the north. And so that's why he does it again. So two places in scripture, animals are killed in a direction to the altar. It's both places to the north. So no surprise to me, it makes perfect sense here what the Lord is doing. And then uh, we pick up here in verse 44. Well, outside of this altar, this, this way here, outside the inner gate uh, were the chambers for the singers in the inner court. That's believed to be right on the very edge, right around here on the sides, on, on either side, right by the outside of the vestibule. There was these uh, little singers courts. So remember, these are Levites. They're singers. And so it was within the family of, of the Levites that also provided priestly, like Asaph was a priest back in the Old uh, Testament and wrote several psalms. So he was a singer. 
and so it was, uh, they were prepared singers at the inner court, one facing south at the side of the northern gateway, the other facing the north at the side of the southern gateway. Then he said, the chamber which faces south is for the priests who have charge of the temple. Chamber which faces the north is for the priests who have charge of the altar. And these are the sons of Zadok. We'll cover them a little bit later. The sons of Zadok, why the Lord chose them. It's a very, very beautiful picture. And he measured the court, 100 cubits long, 100 cubits wide, four square. Now he's just talking about the very intersection here is 100 cubits. From the front of the temple to here and here to here is 100 cubits. And so, uh, you know, the irony is the exact dead center of this, if you went 250 cubits in and 250, that, that brazen altar where the animals are killed is the dead center. The dead center of the temple is the sacrifice. Jesus is the center of our lives. He's our sacrifice. We'd have no life without him. That, that altar is the very center of this temple structure. And he measured the court there, the 100 cubits long. And then, um, let's see, as we, as we end the chapter, uh, let's see. Uh, he's talking about measured the court, 100 cubits long, 100 cubits wide, the four square. He brought me to the vestibule of the temple, measured the doorposts of the uh, vestibule. And uh, now he's going to get into some stuff that's going to be covered in the uh, next chapter. So if you go to slide number four, this really begins here about verse 48. So now he's, he's actually now going to take us into the temple itself, the temple proper. And so now he's talking about the court. I'm sorry, he talked about the court leading up to that. But notice verse 40, he brought me to the vestibule of the temple. So now we're talking about the very entry right here of the temple, right there. And that's what he covers. By the way, I, um, I showed the numbers here of the, all the little cubit measurements down in crossways. So you can add it up, 100, uh, the, the 100 versus 50. And, and all the math works here because the Lord does everything right. By the way, you read this, try to make sense of this. It's a little difficult. The length and width seem to get confused at times. But uh, he says, uh, first off, he went to the doorpost. Five cubits on this side, five on the other. So it starts with the five. You'll see the numbers as you march upwards. And on that side, the width of the gateway were three cubits. That's just a little, added a little al al alcove that's right here, five and then three coming sideways. And then, um, and the width of the gateway was three cubits. The length of the vestibule was 20 cubits. It's width 11. So the next one goes 11 cubits deep. First, he had five for the doorway, which is kind of the, well, the entryway, kind of the original wall. And then the first vestibule, 11 cubits deep by the steps. By the way, on that drawing, when you look at it later, they showed that one as 12 cubits deep, but this says 11. So I think they were off one cubit on that particular measurement. But anyway, he tells us all this, and there were pillars by the doorposts on either side. Now he gets a little bit further into the temple. Then he brought me into the sanctuary, verse 41, measured the doorpost, six cubits wide on one side, six on the other. This is the next pinch point. So he goes five, then 11, and then another six here. Now we're right here on this uh, verse one, six cubits uh, there. And then the width of the entryway was 10 cubits, the side of the walls, five cubits on this side, five on the other. And then, and then its width was, he measured the, its length, 40 cubits. Now that's the first big room. That thing's 40 cubits long. Now it is interesting, the Lord keeps the same dimensions as he originally had with the tabernacle. So remember the original tabernacle, the first room is called the holy place. And the, the, the last room is called the holy of holies. And the first room was two-thirds of the length, and the last room was the one-third. And it was a perfect cube, uh, as the New Jerusalem will be a perfect cube when we, when we get there. And so it's just interesting, uh, all this detail the Lord gives us here. But that was 40 cubits, and then he went inside to measure the doorpost. The little doorpost between the holy place and the most holy place is only two cubits, uh, which, again, that's almost four feet because it's 20 inches, um, uh, at one in uh, the 17 inches uh, per Per foot, and um, so he said there. Uh, let's see, it's almost two feet, so two cubits, nearly four feet. Then it was six cubits high. He's just talking about the size of the door, and the last room's twenty cubits, and it's width twenty cubits, and that was the place of the holy of holies. By the way, what's interesting to me is the the most of the furniture that was in the original is not there. There's no mention of the table of showbread, the table, the lampstand. There's no mention of the ark of the covenant even, which is really interesting. Right, especially interesting, which is another sign we're not under the law of Moses. So the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, everybody today in the Bible prophecy says, where's the Ark of the Covenant? So it doesn't really matter where it is. If the Lord wants to revive it, he can do that. But anyway, 
he got through that whole thing. And then, and then after he gets through that whole thing, it's describing it all. And then you've got the details. Next in verse 5, he goes to kind of a dissection of the uh, temple uh, itself. So we can look at slide number uh, 5. This is kind of a funny drawing here. But if you dissect it halfway down, there's rooms on either side of the temple. So the temple is the big white box in the center, but there's rooms on each side for storage. And so he measured the wall of the temple, six cubits, the width of the temple, four cubits. So here you've got this 20 wide, and then he's got this wall, and this wall, and this wall. So you mentioned here, he gives us the details. The wall is six cubits here. This is only four, and that's five. And so um, uh, he, he mentions all that. So he said that the width, the first floor was six cubits. Then the open area was four cubits. And then this, the chambers were in three stories, one above the other, 30 chambers in each story. And they uh, rested on ledges, which are for the side chambers all around, that they might be supported but not fastened to the wall of the temple. One went up, as one went up from the story to the story, the side chambers, because they became wider all around, because they're supporting ledges in the wall of the temple ascended like steps. You can see them getting larger as you go up. And so, but nonetheless, the, the total shape didn't change. The wall, the wall width just changed. And uh, then, then the width of the structure increased as one went up from the lower story to the higher. Verse 8, I also saw an elevation all around the temple, foundation of the side chambers, a full rod that is six cubits. The thickness of the outer wall of the side chambers was five cubits. And, and so also the remaining terrace by the place of the side chambers of the temple, between it the wall chambers, but the 20 cubits all around. On every side, the doors of the side chambers open to the terrace, one door toward the north, one toward the south, and the width of the terrace was five cubits all around. And you read this and go, wow. You know, we're going to be here with a new body, and we're going to get to really appreciate that and have perfect recall, I think. Go, yeah, Lord, I remember when, I, when we were studying that. And this is really great. I'm really glad that you're telling me about this. Now I think I can handle it. So uh, anyway, let's move back to slide number two. He moves completely past this now to the building. And uh, this is this big building at the very back. There's no Western gate. You notice that? Just the other three. There's a big building at the back. And so he covers that here in verse uh, 12. The building that faces the separating courtyard is its Western end. It was 70 cubits wide and the walls were five. So the, the thickness front to back here is 80 cubits, 70 plus five and five, and then it's 90 wide by five. So that, that building is actually 100 cubits by 80 cubits here. Verse 13, he measured the temple 100 cubits long. He just makes this quick comment about the Western building and tells us really very, very little about it other than it adds up to 100 cubits by 80 cubits. Then verse 13, now he goes back to the temple, 100 cubits long, the separating courtyard with the building uh, and its walls was 100 cubits. The width of the eastern face of the temple, including the separating courtyard, was 100. So um, remember, so there's a, there's, a, there's a hundred here, that's a hundred. And then this is 20 between that and that Western building and the 80 there. And so there's all this uh, amazing symmetry the Lord has built into all of this. And then he says, uh, verse 15, he measured the length of the building behind it, facing the separating courtyards with its galleries on one side and the other side, 100 cubits, as well as the inner court. And um, uh, let's see, where was I? As well as the inner temple and the porches of the court. Their doorposts and their beveled window frames, the galleries all around there, three stories opposite, opposite to the threshold were paneled with wood. Uh, what he's now going to talk about, especially when you get into the temple, the entire interior of the temple is covered in wood. And it's going to be carved with angels and palm trees. Now, that's a big difference from the tabernacle. Because if you remember, even when it was fabric, there was all kinds of gold woven into the fabric. And when Solomon built it, he, made, he overlaid everything with gold. But there isn't that, any of that gold described here. And I, part of me wonders, because Jesus is there. He's heaven. I mean, we're with him. And he's there. We don't need the gold. And it's, 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 it's a little bit of heaven on earth even though it's not the final heaven on earth because there will be sin during the millennial reign. But anyway, interesting with all of this wood. And so it was made with 18 uh, with cherubim and the palm trees, palm tree between cherub and cherub. So each cherub had two faces. That's going to look a little funny. You see a cherub with a face of a man and then the face of a lion. And each one had those two faces. And there was a palm tree between each set of cherubs. And it says, and so that the face of the man was toward a palm tree on one side, the face of a young lion toward a palm tree on the other side. 
It was made throughout the temple, all around, from the floor to the space above the door on the wall of the sanctuary. Cherubim and palm trees were carved. The doorposts of the temple were square, as is the front of the temple. Their appearance was similar. The altar was of wood, three cubits high, and its length, two cubits, its corners. So there is a, one piece of furniture, it appears, in there. And I tend to think, the way it's described and where it's described, I tend to think that's the equivalent of an altar of incense uh, in there to the Lord. So people are still needing to turn to the Lord, and that represents the prayers of the saints. So there is this thing, although again, it's not overlaid with uh, wood. And so anyway, the altar was of wood, three cubits high, its length, two cubits, its corners, its, its uh, length, its sides were of wood. He said to me, this is the table that is before the Lord. And that placement's why I think it's the equivalent of the altar of incense. The temple, the sanctuary had two doors. The two doors had two panels. So when you walked in the, the first door to go in the temple or the door to go in the Holy of Holies, there's two doors, but they both had hinges. So it kind of bent open on both sides. And so uh, that's the door structure the Lord uh, has chosen. And uh, there were cherubim and palm trees were carved on the doors of the temple, just as they were carved on the walls. A wooden canopy was on the front of the vestibule outside, so kind of an overhang as you came into the temple. Beveled windows, frames, palm trees on the one side and the other, on the sides of the vestibule, also on the side chambers of the temple and the canopies. Chapter 42, then he brought me out to the outer court. Now, um, if we can go back, oh, we're in the right place. Imagine now he's going to take him out of this out to the outer court, about over here, and he's going to be looking back at the temple with this man that's giving him this tour. So he's standing to the east in the outer court by way of uh, toward the north, and he brought me into the chamber, which was opposite the separating courtyard. And so now as we're in chapter 42, um, I want you to go to slide number six if we can. Um, what we've got here, I believe he's standing about here, and the man's having him look back, and he's looking at these buildings that say PC here. So they were, they were to, for the priests, and they had uh, the food in there. And so it's very interesting. The, the Lord takes care of his people. Um, we're not replacing Israel, but it's interesting. We're all called priests in the new covenant. And he takes care of us. He promises to take care of our needs. And the priests that are going to serve there is going to make sure they have food. They're going to keep eating the sacrifices. They're going to endless supply of meat, for sure, with the sacrifices that are coming in. But, but he's outside looking back at these particular buildings, and now he's going to tell us about them. And then one is 100 cubits long, and one's 50. The one closer to the outer court is shorter. But we're going to see he's facing back, facing the length, which was 100 cubits. The width of the other, the width was 50 cubits, was the north door. So opposite the inner court was 20 cubits, and, uh, the, uh, and the pavement of the inner court was the gallery against these three stories. So not only is there this separation, but this particular building is also going to be three stories, as were there were three stories on the outer walls of the temple itself. And some drawings, you'll see that. They have three levels in that as well as in the temple. So in the front of the chambers toward the inside, a walk, 10 cubits, a distance of one cubit, their doors face north. The upper chambers were shorter because the galleries took away space from them. Uh, more than the lower and the middle stories of the building. And, and just as the chambers got smaller in the temple, they did here. Uh, actually, there they got larger as you went up in the temple. Out here, they get smaller as you go up. Anyway, there were three stories, did not have pillars, verse 6, like the pillars of the courts. Therefore, the upper level was shortened more than the lower and the middle levels from the ground. And a wall, which was outside, ran parallel to the chambers at the front of the chambers toward the outer court. Its length was 50 cubits. So you can see the outer PC buildings. Um, those are the ones that are shorter. The length of the chambers toward the outer court was 50 cubits, whereas the facing temple was 100 cubits. At the lower chambers was the entrance of the east side as one, uh, in, as one goes into them from the outer court. Also, there were chambers in the thickness of the wall of the court toward the east, opposite the separating courtyard, opposite, opposite the building. And there was a walk in front of them also, and their appearance was like the chambers, which were toward the north. They were as long as, and as wide as the others. All their exits and entrances were according to the plan. And corresponding to the doors of the chambers that were facing south as one enters them, there was a door in front of the walk, the way directly in front of the wall toward the east. And then he said the north chambers are the, and the south chambers, which are opposite the separating courtyard. Here it is. Here's why he goes all the trouble for these two buildings. They're the holy chambers where the priests who approach the Lord shall eat the most holy offerings that they shall lay the most holy offerings. So once the animals were burned up on the altar, they would take them off and take them out there and, and eat them. And so that would provide the food for them to be nourished and keep doing the work of the Lord. 
And so they laid the most holy offerings, the grain offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, for the place is holy. When the priests enter them, they shall not go out of the holy chamber into the outer court, but they shall, uh, there they shall leave the garments in which they minister, for they are holy. Now this is interesting. If you're a priest and you're going to serve, it's your turn to serve, and you're a priest of the family of Zadok. There are others served, but as the actual ministry of the priest was the family of Zadok. When you went in, you came in your normal clothing. But once you came to that outer court, when you stepped in, you immediately went into those chambers and, and got dressed. Mm -hmm. And so what I really love about this imagery, and there are these really beautiful little nuggets in here, is remember throughout Scripture, clothing is a picture of righteousness. And even in the Old Testament, the Lord had every priest. Every priest wore white robes. In the same way Jesus promised to clothe us all with white robes. And so it's very beautiful. So, and what was interesting is when they came out, the they were to take them off when they were out in public. And so they weren't to flaunt who they are or think they're more special or anything. But when they came to represent the Lord, the picture is you must come to God on his terms and in his clothing, in his righteousness. Also reminds me, if you remember, there was once the parable of the man that had a wedding for his son and he provided the garments. He said many of the people didn't want to come. But if you remember, it was, there was one man that came but didn't put on the garments that were offered him. And the picture is it's God offered his righteousness. And the man said, no, I want to come to the wedding, but on my terms, in my righteousness. And the Lord said, no, kick him out. Boot him out. I won't let anybody in on, on based on his own righteousness. And that's the picture. The priest put on the clothing when they were there, whenever they served for the Lord. And so, anyway, that was the imagery. So their garments, which they ministered to, they were not to wear out. They shall put on other garments, and then they approach, uh, the, then they may approach that which is for the people. And then the outer dimension of the temple, now he jumps completely to the outside of the whole temple itself. You can go all the way back to uh, overhead number two, which was just the big picture. Now imagine going the whole way around this thing. And this little couple of verses is a little confusing as if the last <laughs> we've looked at wasn't. What's confused is the word rod and cubit get confused in this one um, because we're quite confident with all the measurements. You add it all up, it's 500 cubits by 500 cubits. Well, the word rod gets thrown in a little too much. It was a measuring rod he was using to measure. But the actual full exterior wall was 500 cubits by 500 cubits. So it reads, when he had finished measuring the inner temple, he brought me out through the gateway that faces toward the east, measured it all around. He measured the east side with the measuring rod, 500 rods. It's 500 cubits long. So this, this gets a bit confusing. And there's various explanations when I get to the It's one of those questions filed away when we get to heaven. Was that a scribal error that's, that they put rod there? 500 rods? Uh, because, well, let's just read it. And you'll see verse 20 tells us exactly what it is. He measured the north side 500 rods by the measuring the south side, verse 18, 500 rods by the measuring rod. Verse 19, the west side, 500 rods. But then in verse 20, he measured the, it on the four sides the wall around 500 cubits long and 500 wide. It's 500 cubits by 500 cubits. And all the math we've looked at clearly uh, bears that out. So the entire temple, but it'll be quite large. And uh, I haven't mentioned it before, but you could fit 13 entire American football fields in that temple area including the end zones. I mean, it's, it's a huge, massive, massive structure that will exist uh, in the future. And so anyway, we come to our final chapter tonight, um, the temple and the Lord's uh, dwelling place, chapter 53. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. This is the highlight of the night. I mean, so you look at this and go, wow, Lord, okay, you went through that. I mean, you, we love the nuggets of, you know, the temple, the sacrifice being in the dead center, uh, you know, imagery of gold and various things, the, the animals being killed on the north side. But what's the point of a temple if God's not there? What's the, what's the point of it at all? So it's no surprise to me the Lord left the coming of his glory to the last chapter that's really a description of the temple. And if you remember when we went earlier into this chapter, I'm sorry, in the book of Ezekiel, it was earlier in Ezekiel chapter 10 when the glory of the Lord departed. The Lord said, you people are so evil. I've been trying to wake you up for hundreds of years. I've had enough. And I'm just going to remove you from the land. And by the way, I'm going to remove my presence from the temple. Do you imagine what it would be like? I mean, I hope we'd even notice if we came to church and the Holy Spirit didn't show up. The Lord says this when two or more gathered in our name. That's why we need to come together. That's why the church needs to come together. That's why the Lord commanded us to fellowship because there's a special presence of his Holy Spirit. Without the presence of the Holy Spirit, we're just going through religious... Uh, 
movements. We need the presence of the Lord in our midst. We need him doing supernatural things. So what's so glorious about this chapter is the glory of the Lord returns. The glory of the Lord returns. This is the whole beauty of the future temple is the glory of the Lord is there. And so it is just really, really exciting here when we see this. So afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. Now he's all the way back to the very entryway. And Ezekiel had previously seen the glory of the Lord get up and leave. Get up and leave. He saw it. And I'm, I'm sure he was extremely heartbroken. But now he's seeing the opposite in the future one day. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. No surprise comes from the east because Jesus will come to the Mount of Olives, set his feet down directly to the east and come through that eastern gate when he, and rebuild his temple. His voice was like the sound of many waters. Now I think we're seeing Jesus himself. Because the voice of many waters is what the description we see in Revelation 1. Where it says his feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. His voice was as the sound of many waters. So I believe this is the Lord himself coming. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw. The vision which I saw when I came to destroy this city. The vision which were like the vision I saw by the river Kebar, and I fell on my face. Now, if you remember in the beginning of Ezekiel, chapter 1 and chapter 10 is when he saw those visions of these four awesome cherubim kind of holding a firmament with the, temp with the throne of God on it. It's kind of like the olden days when you have the, the, the uh, servants carrying the chair of somebody, some, some VIP. Well, it's, the picture is as though they're, they're, they're carting the Lord around. And so this was the vision you hearken back to, Reve to Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. The glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate face that faces towards the east. And the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. So he's probably stunned by the glory of God. And we see people in their flesh, see God in his glory. It, it, it just, people like they fall down like they're dead. So it's like, he, it, it's no surprise to me. It says the spirit moved him because he probably couldn't move. He probably felt like he was just totally done for. So the, so the Lord lifted him up and brought him into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And he finally sees it again. But from the time it left back then till now, it's been 2,600 years since there's been a temple with the glory of the Lord in it. But it'll happen again soon. I think very soon. And so the Lord's glory will be there. And so the glory of the Lord filled. I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he said, son of man, this is the place of my throne. This is, I believe, the Lord from inside speaking out to him after Jesus went in and fills the place with his glory. This is the place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the house of Israel defile my name. So remember, they're going to turn back to the Lord, I believe, right during the middle of the great tribulation. And they're going to love the Lord. And I believe this is one of the reasons the Lord's going to let them give the sacrifice so the world will see the Jewish people properly worshiping the Lord. And they'll respect them for it. This world has seemingly never respected the Jewish people for their role in this world. To give the Messiah and to be the people that bore the, the law of Moses and bore the word of God. And so people will reverence them. So they won't defile the Lord anymore. They nor their kings by their harlotry or with their carcasses of their kings on their high places. When they set their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost and a wall between them and me, they defiled my holy name by the abominations that they committed. Therefore, I have consumed them in my anger. So he's just reminding Ezekiel, I had to consume them. But there's a future hope that I will restore it and I'll let my glory come back and they will get to worship me. He says, now let them put their harlotry uh, uh, put their harlotry and their carcasses of their kings far away from me. I'll dwell in their midst forever. Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel. Why? Now, this is interesting. So remember, he was told earlier that he was to declare this, all of this vision he saw. And now he's telling him again, he's being told to uh, describe this temple to the house of Israel. Here is why, that they may be ashamed of their iniquity. Isn't that interesting? The Lord will use conviction. You know, there's supposed to be a legitimate shame for sin. You know, there was a day when people said, are you ashamed of what you've done? And now there's like no shame with sin. There's no shame seemingly in our society. It's almost like the, the weirder, the better. It was like it, there's, that people shame you today for not sleeping around before marriage and things like that. 
And, and so there's supposed to be a legitimate shame. When they s picture the, the, the temple and the glory of the Lord, there should be a shame that I really don't deserve to be in the presence of the Lord. So he said they, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. If they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple. Isn't it interesting the Lord means for this design to do something for them? Isn't that interesting? I mean, it makes me wonder if they're going to get some extra insights for the Lord. Why would this design speak something so to them? So I think in heaven, the Lord is going to reveal to us many and incredible details about this temple that we just glossed over tonight here. So they'll, they'll be getting this. So make known to them the design of the temple, its exits, its entrances, its entire design, all its ordinances, all its forms, and all its laws. So notice there will be some laws, some order. This is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountaintop is most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. And then we basically end the night and I know we're getting close to running out of time, but it, it is interesting. The Lord's going to spend a, the last part of this chapter describing the altar, the altar where the offerings will be made. Remember, this is the very center. So this is seven, the last slide for the night, I believe. And so uh, there we go. This is going to be a quite, a, quite a large uh, altar. So let's just uh, read this. He says here, these are the measurements of the altar in cubits. Remember, this is a long cubit. The cubit is one cubit and a hand breadth. So it says 21 inches. We've been talking throughout all of this. The base uh, was one cubit high, one wide. Now, we're not talking about one base. You see, the, he's talking about the very lowest level here. When he says one level, it's one cubit high. It's one cubit higher than the one above it. And so that's the first level here, verse 13. And, um, and then he's going to go to the next level. And so... We're actually talking about here, I think it's about 18 cubits by 18 cubits at the top of the bottom level, the, the widest spot. And uh, this is the height of the altar, verse 14, from the base of the ground to the lower ledge, two cubits. The next level is two cubits high, the width of the ledge, one cubit. So that's uh, two cubits shorter than the bottom level. The smaller ledge to the larger ledge, four cubits for the next and its width also came in one cubit, so two cubits shorter. And the very top altar hearth is four cubits high. So it's funny how the first was one, then two, then four, then four. But that's, that's the height there, the bottom of the graph of the chart there. But anyway, the very top, the altar hearth is 12 cubits long, 12 wide. So if you can picture the top one's 12, then 14 by 14, 16 by 16, and the bottom base is 18 by 18 cubits. It's a pretty large uh, here, and you can see those measurements are there by feet. So the very top one's 21 feet by 21 feet. So they'd be, that's quite a barbecue, isn't it? You start thinking about, you pull out your little barbecue at home. Mine's like this big, little tiny little thing. 21 feet by 21 feet barbecue. That's a lot of animals you can be burning on that, uh, on that altar. Talk about a sweet smelling aroma. It'll be quite amazing. So he talks about the ledge and all that, in the, all that there in, in verse uh, 17. Verse 18, he said to me, Son of man, thus says the Lord, these are the ordinances for the altar on the day when it is made for sacrificing burnt offerings. And, and now we're going to begin to see more and more offerings, burnt offerings. There are actually burnt offerings. We're going to see sin offerings, peace offerings. And so he, they were to sprinkle the blood on it. You shall give a young bull for a sin offering for the priests. Remember, the first offering for people was typically sin offering. For the priests, under the law of Moses, there are many similarities to the law of Moses here, but many differences. But for the priest, first was to be a sin offering. And so, um, let's see, verse 13, 19, you shall give a young bull for an offering to the priest. Levites were of the seed of Zadok, who approached me to minister to me, says the Lord. You shall take some of its blood, put it on the four horns of the altar, on the four corners of the ledge, on the rim around it. Thus you shall cleanse it, make atonement for it. You shall take the bull of the sin offering and burn it in the appointed place of the temple outside the sanctuary. So the first day, it just looks like there's just a bull here. Uh, but later, we're going to see uh, that uh, every day they were, to bear, they were to burn a bull and a goat uh, for the priest. Second day, offering of the kid of the goats without blemish for a sin offering. They shall cleanse the altar and cleanse it and they, as they cleanse with the bull. When they have finished cleansing it, you shall offer a young bull without blemish, a ram from the flock without blemish. So you've got three animals now. When you offer them before the Lord, the priest shall throw salt on them, for they will offer them up as a burnt offering for the Lord. And salt's a preservative, as we know, we're the salt of the earth. 
because of our relationship with Jesus. And he says, every day for seven days, you shall prepare a goat for a sin offering, you shall prepare a young bull and a ram for the flock, uh, both without blemish. Now, that's another similarity to the law of Moses. There was a seven-day preparation for priests to serve the Lord. On the eighth day, they could be in serving the Lord. He's going to do that again uh, in the future. It'll be a great privilege to serve the Lord during this time. Seven days they shall make atonement for the altar and purify it, and so sanctify it, consecrate it. And when these days are over, uh, it shall be on the eighth day, and thereafter the priest shall offer your burnt offerings, your peace offerings on the altar. I'll accept them, says the Lord. Wow. There you go. So you may again look at this, and, and I really do hope when you look at this, these chapters, and go, wow, Lord, why of all the things you could have said in Scripture, would you come and give that much detail about a building? It's that important to him. I mean, think about it. This is the word of God. This is it. And God's very happy with what he's given us. And he chose those chapters to tell us about that temple. That's meaningful to him. But do at least take away from tonight. Man, if the Lord cares about that level of detail, how foolish is it to think I'm going through a hard time and God doesn't care about what I'm going through? I mean, it's just, just, it's almost a ridiculous thought. I don't say that to make somebody feel bad. I just say, I want us to think that way. He cares about every little thing in our life. And so we can take everything to him. And I love the end there that he gets to be worshiped. He will reveal himself. He'll show himself and he will reveal his glory to the nation of Israel once again. And they'll turn back to him. And I say, thank you, Lord, for what's uh, in the future for the people of Israel. And anyway, just love the Lord. Let me close in prayer. We'll have a very brief uh, uh, half a song if we can <laughs> run out of time tonight. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for tonight. And Lord, it, it, it's really interesting to study this. You took all the time to write this down and you want us to know it. You gave some of the very specific reasons why you wanted the people of Israel to know about that temple. Because it spoke of a need to realize how holy and righteous you are. That's the very place of your dwelling and where your glory resides. They had forgotten about your glory. May we never forget about your glory, Lord, as we walk with you and talk with you in this life. So thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for reminding us you're a stunning God of detail. And uh, may we take you that way and live that way. So thank you, Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and just sing a, a little bit here. <laughs> With all of my heart And I will praise you With all of my strength And I will seek you With all of my day God, we serve so amazing. Let me close in prayer. Father, again, we thank you that you care about uh, us so much. You care about the people of Israel. There's plans for them. You have tremendous plans for us. Lord, this world is really hurting. I know you know that more than we do. And you intend for us to be salt and light to this world. We know all of this stuff that's going to happen in the future. It's all settled in heaven. And it's going to be settled on earth as well. So Lord, may we walk in the truths, walk in the joy of knowing everything is within your grasp. And you're not fretting tonight. You're not panicking at all. Nothing surprises you, even though much surprises us. So thank you, Lord, for being such a God of detail and loving us. And uh, there being nothing beneath you to look into our lives and minister to us. So bless us tonight, Lord. Fill us with your spirit, we pray, with your hope and joy and peace. And we ask your blessings in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. One last thing before we close tonight. This Saturday, we're going to have a booth here. There's a local fair. And uh, we're going to have a table from 3 to 9. And I'm going to be reaching out, reaching out to people that are willing to be part of the community. So I'll be there for most of the time. And so if you want to come out, let me know. Be a chance to just minister to people in the community. Share about the Lord and evangelism and about the church and all that. So we'll be doing that uh, this Saturday from 3 to 9. We're we'll next to a table with Frank with the community sharing. So it should be a great time. And this is what the we're looking for. And the Lord's already providing some great opportunities uh, to get out there and minister to people. So please be praying for us. You know, who knows? We're hoping to impact a lot of people th this Saturday, uh, the first time we're out. And uh, uh, please pray. And if you want to get out and serve, let me know. So God bless you. Have a good night.